الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبت في الله continue on in our study of Bulugh Maram the comprehensive book we reach the third chapter entitled Bab al Zuhud wal Wara the chapter of asceticism and piety and a Zuhud or asceticism and piety meaning wara they have different meanings in the shara and that when we <coughs> reference those two terminologies it necessitates that we can distinguish the two. And a zuhud or asceticism, it references or refers to huwa turk ma la yanfa' fil akhira. So zuhud or asceticism <clears throat> this refers to leaving off that which has no benefit for the hereafter a zuhud refers to leaving off that which has no benefit for the hereafter and when a person Yazhad fi dunya that they have this asceticism in this life that refers to that they only engage in those things which are going to bring about benefit for them in the hereafter. So this is uh, what it refers to, what uh, uh, Zuhud refers to. And al wara refers to leaving off that which does not harm you for the hereafter. So wara Uh, references piety and that could actually leave be leaving something which is not muharram but yet it is leaving off that which uh, could potentially harm you in the hereafter And zuhud, asceticism, a zuhur, uh, a zuhud is more comprehensive as a term. So having uh, asceticism is more comprehensive and inclusive of being a person of wara. And to be able to combine those characteristics of being of those who leave off that which uh, has no benefit in their hereafter and to be far away from those things which 
cause harm, then this is the most uh, complete, and this is what the Zahid, the person who is an ascetic, that they do. They leave off that which has no benefit and will not harm them, obviously. And the person of Wara, they may not be of those who leave off uh, all of those uh, complete characteristics. So the first hadith, the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu ta'ala an, that this hadith will clarify for us what it is to possess al-wara. And al-wara, for the sake of clear clarity, to distinguish between a zuhud and al wara, al wara or piety, it refers to avoiding the shubahat. And this is what we see from the from its usage in the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu ta'ala an. So, a zuhud is referencing the practice of leaving off those things which will busy you in the hereafter. Those things which busy you from the hereafter. And... It is a desire to do those things which will benefit you in the hereafter and preparing for the hereafter. And so, a zuhd fil haram wa makruhat wa ba'd al mubahat. To have a zuhud with regards to the haram and those things which are makru or disliked and those things which are actually permissible but have no sharia benefit, these things can all busy you with regards to your hereafter. So it would be from zuhud to leave those things. An example of zuhud in this life with regards to Muharramat, the one who leaves off, for example, the practice of, in, uh, of consuming intoxicants. Okay? Intoxicants, this is Muharram. This is Haram. That's the Hukum. And from Zuhud, from asceticism would be to leave that clearly because there is no Sharia benefit by using those intoxicants. And in fact, it harms your hereafter. So there is no benefit for their hereafter with regards to it. So this would be a, a zuhd fi haram. A zuhd fi makruhat, leaving off something which is disliked, might be, for example, some practice or those practices which are uh, disliked in the shara but not muharram. And when we say that they're makru, that means that by engaging in them, you incur no sin, but by leaving them, you, recur, you incur reward. And by leaving off those types of activities, which are makru, this is from zuhd. This is from Zuhud, this is from asceticism. And the third example might be of those who leave off the mubahat. Those things which are mubah, that they are uh, permissible, but they have no 
reward attached to using them or engaging in them and they have no uh, no sin no sin uh, or reward for, for using it. For example, uh, maybe someone who enjoys sports and we're not discouraging you from enjoying sports or partaking, taking place in sports. But for example, the one who loves to watch football on TV. That this, we could say, in general is mubah. That there's no hukum attached to it. Except that you may see people dressed improperly and things like this. So, from uh, zuhud, because there is no sharia benefit from by in this activity, you know, it's, it's an activity that perhaps is mubah, then by leaving it out of zuhud, out of asceticism, because there's no benefit for your hereafter, then this would be the expression, this would be illustrating someone who is a zahid. You know, from piety, they leave it. Or from their asceticism, they leave it. And you can see the relationship between uh, uh, a zuhud and wara, that they're fairly close in meaning to a, a certain uh, extent. And this would be from zuhud. As for wara, the wara or piety, if you will, then this is leaving off those things which are doubtful. Those things in which you are not sure of whether they are halal or they are haram or whether they have benefit or they have no benefit. So this is from wara, from piety, to leave off the, the doubtful things. And as we'll see in the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir, that, the, عنه, that this is how one preserves his or her religion and one, and his or her honor. And we'll find that we'll, uh, as we get into the hadith, we'll see even more so and have a clearer picture of what it is, this expression of wara especially. And so moving into the hadith, Nu'man ibn Bashir radiallahu ta'ala said, I heard Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam saying, and Nu'man, he pointed with his two fingers to his ears. What is lawful is clear, and what is unlawful is clear. But the, between them are certain doubtful matters, which many people do not know. Thus he who guards against doubtful matters keeps his religion and his honor safe. But he who falls into doubtful matters falls into what is unlawful, just as a shepherd who pastures his animals around a sanctuary, all but grazing therein. Surely every king has a sanctuary, and a law's sanctuary is his prohibitions. Surely there is a piece of flesh in the body. If it is healthy, the whole body is healthy. But if it is diseased, then the whole body will be diseased. Verily, it is the heart. Mutafakun alayhi. So this is an immense hadith, the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir, radiallahu ta'ala anhu which is a hadith, and this is why Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani uh, entitled this chapter as uh, the chapter of zuhud wa wara, or the chapter of asceticism and piety, uh, because this hadith 
is of those group of ahadith which belong to the topic or they emphasize the subject of being pious and being cautious about those things one engages in in, in the dunya. You know, be benefiting yourself and involving yourself in those things which bring about good and benefit and bring out and the goodness, as we mentioned prior to this, al-ma'ruf, goodness, that this is what the shara refers to as good goodness, meaning that the parameters set for us as far as what is good and what is defined as evil are those things which are as they are defined in the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And so those are our parameters. That is our yardstick for making judgments about when something is good and when something is evil. And when leaving off something is from zuhud. And when uh, avoiding something is from wara. And so this hadith, the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir, is illustrating for us al-wara. <clears throat> In this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إن الحلال بين وإن الحرام بين وبينهما أمور مشتبهة لا يعلمهن كثير من الناس. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam said, "Verily, that which is lawful is clear, and that which is prohibited is clear. And between them, meaning between the halal and between the haram." Are mushtabihat. These are things which are ambiguous or things which are unclear of whether as to whether they are halal or haram. These are doubtful issues, doubtful matters. And then the Prophet وسلم, said, La ya'lamuhunna kathir bin an nas. Uh, many of the people don't know about them, meaning they don't know whether they're halal or their haram. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he divided things into the halal and the haram, and he said, uh, or he divided things into what you might say two classifications or two types. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam divided, divided things into that which is clear and to that which is unclear or doubtful. The clear things comprises of halal and haram. The doubtful things are things which are doubtful. So those are the two classifications in accordance with this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that which is clear, which is the halal and haram. We know, for example, uh, I don't believe that except in the most extreme circumstances that there is a Muslim that believes uh, and is unaware of the ruling with regards to intoxicants or uh, adultery. That, that those things even non-Muslims know generally know this about Muslims. That they, if they have any, if they've ever heard of a Muslim, then they're almost certainly aware that Muslims are not supposed to partake in intoxicants, especially alcohol. And they also are mostly aware that Muslims are not supposed to commit adultery or commit fornication. So those ahkam are clear to everyone. Those ahkam are clear to everyone except perhaps someone who recently became Muslim or some, perhaps, if we can to this, uh, a Muslim village 
deep in some remote country or remote land within a country in which they have no scholars, in which they have no uh, one to teach them or have had no one to teach them and they did not, are unaware. But even that, it's pretty clear the hujj, the hujja or the evidences have been established with the Quran as far as that. That it's clear with regards to, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands or prohibits in a very clear prohibition, la taqra zina, you know, don't go near adultery and do not, uh, you know, also the, the prohibition of intoxicants. So those are pretty clear ahkam that anyone who can read and has any comprehension of the Quran, the most limited of the Arabic language or the languages articulated for them in their language, they know this. So those we would refer to as ahkam that are bayan, that are clear. As for the other, and also along with that, as he, as the Prophet ﷺ said, as far as those clear ahkam, in the halal bayan, that the halal, the permissible things are also clear. For example, the command, which is not just a per, uh, uh, that it's permissible, but we are commanded with it, that Muslims know that they must pray, even if they differ with regard to the one who leads the prayer. But that is associated, the pillars of Islam is clear, is, is clear to, to, uh, to any Muslim especially anyone you would say is a practicing Muslim, they know the Arkan al-Islam. They know that there are five pillars of Islam. So those are clear that we're ordered, those ahkam are clear that there's something called hajj, a pilgrimage to Mecca that we make. So in the remote, remote places, people are generally clear about that hukum. So the halal and the haram are clear. In al halal bayin, in al haram bayin. But then the other qism, the other division, and between them are doubtful things. So between those two, uh, that first qism, that first division, which is the halal and the haram, there are doubtful things. And the Prophet said, uh, many uh, people are unaware. Of, of, of these things. And perhaps for greater clarity, instead of mentioning those commandments, mentioning as far as the halal, we might say things like uh, water, okay? Uh, uh, dates. You know, people, I don't believe there's any Muslim who has a doubt about those things. Those things are very clear that they are halal. They are permissible. To partake in cigarettes might be something closer to bringing doubt for some people but the other things are very clear that they're halal apples I don't think anyone believes and has doubt that apples are mubah that they're permissible they're halal to partake in and so those are from the halal that is bayin but then as we mentioned there is the qasam uh, amur mushtabihat those things which there is doubt or there is some ambiguity about them. And Ben Othaymin mentions a, a, a big faide when the Prophet about when the Prophet says La Ya'lamuna Kathira bin Nas that many of the people don't know about. He says that statement of the Prophet implies that there are many people who don't know, you know, they don't know whether it's halal or haram about uh, those amur mushtabihat, those unclear things, those things that there's some amb ambiguity in them. And it implies that there are those who do know and that, there's, that there are many people who do know. So he, he mentions that there are, he says, that it means and it implies that there are many people who do know. And those people who do know, 
those are the people of knowledge bi'idnillah ta'ala ahl al-ilm ar-rasikhun fi al-ilm and those people who know as we said those people are comprised of Ahl al-Ilm, the people of knowledge. And especially the major scholars when it comes to what is known as Fiqh and Nawazah, those new uh, issues that come up which were not known in the history of Islam or the history of humanity, hum humankind. There are new issues that we encounter as human beings from new inventions and new, new situations, new forms of uh, political change and things like this. That this arasakun uh, fil ilm that they are are those who uh, know how to deal with that and they are those people who ya'lamuna nusus shar they are those when we're referring to the people who know and especially the people of ahl al ilm those are the people who know what they know the text of the shar. Meaning they know the book of Allah and they know the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They have memorized and they know they are favored with fiqh, fideen, with understanding of those texts. And how to benefit from those texts and how to apply those texts. And the hikmah and the wisdom of putting things in their proper place. They know this. This is the role and the fadl of Ahl al-Ilm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them and part of their job that's very important the Ahl al -ilm, they understand I meaning the people of knowledge they understand how to apply those texts of the book of Allah and the son of the messenger of Allah that's very important Kiva istidlal, wa yarafuna al medlul, and they also know and understand what the evidence shows, what the evidence shows or what it proves. And an example, Ben Othmani mentions, for example, knowledge of the dalil. This is a necessity. And people, uh, maybe general people, some of the people may know the uh, the evidence for something. And the dalil that something is halal or the dalil that something is haram, meaning the proof that something is halal and something is haram. Or from the sunnah of the me message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or from the ijma of the salaf, the consensus of the salaf. Ridwan Allahi alayhim. But the istilal, meaning how to use that evidence, whether it is general evidence or whether it is specific evidence, whether it uh, is something to be applied to in, uh, an individual or individuals or it is for a general, it covers uh, a general group of people. And this comes from the istilal, whether it's general or whether it's specific in its understanding and how we use the text and how we understand the text and how we apply the text. All of this is is kafiya istilal, is how to use the evidence. And that's why it's very important, uh, and, and, and referring back to Ahl al-Ilm, because you have many people who know, they may have memorized something from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa but of course, Ahl al-Bidah. Of course, Ahl bidah many of the ru'us of Ahl bidah and even the awam of Ahl bidah that they are aware, you know, the Qur'an is, is there for us. The speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the divine speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was not created, is there for us to read, for everyone. But how you understand it and apply rulings in there, there are things in there which are not clear. There is those things with the muhkamat, 
Humu umul kitab. And and the others are those verses which are ambiguous, meaning they have they are open to uh, they they have a uh, they are liable to interpretation. There's some some ambiguity in there, and only those who know, meaning ahl al know how to apply those ambiguous things in the Qur'an because they are well versed in the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, as I mentioned, there will be those, there's plenty of people from Ahl Bid'ah who know the book and know that what they know of the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but their application, their istidlal of the evidences is how they trick people and deceive people or they are deceived themselves because they do not know how to make proper istidlal. They don't know how to look at the evidence and apply it properly so all of that comes to comes down to the text where the prophet said and many of the people uh, are, are unaware they're unaware of how to uh, of the hukum they're unaware of how to make it loud proper use of the text as well And there are countless examples, but we don't want to extend and go uh, beyond what is necessary or to cause confusion. Also, within the uh, text itself, the Prophet wasallam showed us cave a taslim fidinik wa erdik, how to be safe and secure in one's religion and in one's honor. And that goes back to the other statement he said, And the Prophet ﷺ said between them is the doubtful things that many people are unaware of the... Uh, of the ruling of those doubtful things or being aware of those doubtful things and by leaving those doubtful things as it comes in the hadith that a person safeguards their religion and their honor. Moving on to the fawaid or the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi which is immense which are immense immense benefits. Uh, one of the first benefits that we gain from this hadith is that it is necessary for a person who has information to give that they emphasize and affirm the information they are giving and articulating for the people listening to that information. Meaning that they illustrate it properly and they convey that message properly. And in this hadith, the hadith of Nu'man ibn Bashir is that he used his fingers, he put his fingers up to his ears or pointed them to his ears to illustrate and emphasize uh, the text that he was going to articulate. So this is for emphasis. And so this shows us that this is something which is very important in order to emphasize our message that we use appropriate body language if, if need be in order to emphasize uh, something which is of great importance. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did this. For example, in the hadith where the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he drew a line in the sand and he said, Hadha Sabeel Allah. Thumma khatta ala yamini wa khatta an yasarihi. And then he drew a line on the right and he drew one on the left. And he said, Hadha hi subur. Those are the paths, meaning that, and at the end of each one of those paths, 
is a shaitan that calls to it. So here the Prophet ﷺ actually drew what would be a picture or an illustration in order to make it very clear and very uh, and, and to emphasize for those listening to him relate this hadith to emphasize the danger of calling to bid'ah and following bid'ah and stay and avoiding the path uh, the Saratullah al mustaqim you know, uh, to, to make sure that a person adheres to the book of Allah, the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in accordance with the Madhab of the Salaf. That the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he drew these lines in the, in the sand. And this was for emphasis, to emphasize for those people listening, so that they would, you know, have a good, uh, a clear image, a clear picture, and clear comprehension. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that it shows us that the halal and the haram or that things can be when it comes to the to, to uh, the ahkam al -shar, as far as looking at whether something is clear or unclear, that he divided it into three categories. So this is another way of articulating and understanding what we talked about before. That there are things that are haram, there are things that are halal, and there are things that are doubtful. So we learned this from the hadith of the Prophet because he said, in al halal bayin, wa in al haram bayin, wa baynahuma mur mushtabihat. So that's three things. There's clear, halal, and as we mentioned before, we mentioned the two clear things, halal and haram. And the third thing was the amur mushtabihat, is the doubtful things. Another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is this hadith also shows us that people differ with regards to their level of knowledge. Because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said la ya'lamuhuna kathira min nas That many of the people uh, are unaware. You know, many of the people don't know. They don't know the hukum with regards to those things which are doubtful. And so that lets us know that there are those who know and there are those who don't know. And even from those who know and those who don't know, the people to follow it. They have different levels. Meaning there are different levels of scholarship. There's, different le there's a difference between a new student of knowledge and a seasoned, more mature, and more steeped in knowledge, student of knowledge. And there's a difference between a student of knowledge in that category to a sheikh, to a, a scholar. And amongst the scholars, they have different levels. There's a difference between a scholar who, is, who has knowledge and the one who has much more knowledge. And between him and the one who has. Who has even greater knowledge. And greater understanding in fiqh fi deen. Or has more comprehensive knowledge and experience and wisdom in hikmah. So it shows us that people have different levels of knowledge. Likewise with the category, categories of jahil. Of people of ignorance. People have different levels of ignorance similar to the way they have different levels of knowledge. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that it is necessary for people to strive to understand the doubtful matters so that way they will be on certainty and clarity in their practice and in their affairs. And with regards to those doubtful things, if it is doubtful, then it is from wara, I meaning it is from piety, as we mentioned, to leave off those things, those the, the uh, mushtaba those things which are unclear. They're unclear whether they're halal or they're haram. So it's from wara to leave those things. Another benefit of this hadith 
is it also shows us that it is necessary, it's an obligation for people to leave those things which threaten their religion and their honor. So that those are characteristics of the mu'min and of the zahid and of the one who has wara, the one who has piety and asceticism, is that they strive to do those things which are beneficial and to avoid those things which are harmful and they leave off even as the, the one who has wara leaves off those things which are doubtful. And they do that in order to protect and preserve their religion, to stay away from the haram. And they do that in order to leave uh, those doubtful issues, in order to prevent themselves from falling into the haram or destroying their honor by involving themselves in something they don't know. And there are countless examples we could give, but I think it's the idn law that it's clear <coughs> with regards to the issue. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us the principle of sadda dhara'i. The principle of closing the door to evil. You know, closing the door to those things which are muharram. And that can lead us to sinfulness. Uh, and because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, وَمَنْ وَقَعَ فِي shubahat." haram. Whoever falls into the doubtful things, then they are assured, assuredly will fall into the haram. Okay? Because they're dancing on the fence of haram. They don't know. They don't know whether it's halal or haram, and then they find out later, oh, that, that was haram. So then they've invo involved in haram, and maybe they've tainted their honor now, and they have tainted their religion by committing sin. So this is the point. Sanda dhariya is when you, you but from the wara, you're leaving off that. From wara, you are stay avoiding the doubtful things. And this helps to preserve your falling into the haram and your honor. Another benefit of this hadith is the husna ta'lim and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the excellence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a teacher. And then we have countless examples and this hadith uh, illustrates that for us that he, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gave uh, a very strong example of the one who is guarding his sheep and allowing for them to graze outside of their pasture, even in the pasture on the fence of pa unclear fence of the pasture of their neighbor, meaning that they can walk on, they can easily fall into that pasture. And if you've seen sheep and camels graze and other grazing animals, you understand that, you know, people, they, they have maybe their own land or they're grazing in a land that's open land, but then they can easily, if it's not fenced off, fall, go into someone else's land, some private land. It's very easy for one of the sheep or one of the camels or one of the cows or one of the farm animals to wander into the pasture of your neighbor or of the person who... Uh, someone else's pasture and violate their right taking from their pasture. And this was the example the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave in order to make it clear to the people. Because the one, if you're a grazing animal, it grazes in there, you've grazed and you've fallen into taking from someone else's land. Your, your animal has contributed to violating the right of someone else. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned and gave the example that the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his prohibitions. So when you are involving yourself in the doubtful things, you know, you don't know whether it's halal or haram, but you just immerse yourself in it, then it it's like you're playing on the fence of those things which could be a violation of the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that you transgress the bounds by going into the Muharram. Because you don't know whether it's halal or haram. Is this halal or haram? I'm going to kind of play with it, and I'm going to be involving myself in it, and then, waqa'at al haram. So the Prophet so this illustrates his excellent way of teaching, as he gave us something 
especially for those people, but for all of us as an example that we can grasp and understand. And another benefit of this hadith is it shows that the sanctuary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning those sacred things to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, are his, the uh, muharamihi, those things which are prohibited by him, those things which he has prohibited for us to do, that that is his sanctuary, that we should not involve ourselves. And the ulama, they mention, with regards, for example, the ayat, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fi kitab al-kareem, tilka hududullah, fala taqrabuha. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and that is the boundary of Allah, and do not go close to it. This ayat is a reference to violating the commands of Allah by going into the haram. And this is what illustrates, is illustrated in this hadith. And, and through the example the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us. And the other group of ayat, for example, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions, also in Surah Al-Baqarah, and he says, Tilka hududullah fala ta'taduha. When Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says this in Surah Al-Baqarah, that this is the boundary of Allah also, this uh, and this is the the boundary of Allah. Fala ta'taduha. Then do not transgress it, do not go beyond it. That taqrabuha in the first ayat, going near it. Ta'taduha, going beyond it, to transgress it, that this is re in re reference, don't transgress what? The wajib, the, uh, the obligatory bounds, going going beyond the bounds. And showing us the danger of both, of transgressing by violating and going into the haram, and transgressing by exceeding the halal, going, you know, going beyond, the maybe being extreme. Uh, another benefit of this hadith, and there are immense benefits, and we'll suffice ourselves, uh, is that this hadith also illustrates for us that the heart is the thing which controls the body. And it is, it is the controller and it is the planner, if you will, of the actions of the the body you know we make our intention and and so on and so forth and this involves our heart and our intellect and that our deeds and our body you know our body following and com and doing actions that this follows that and the prophet sallallahu and we understand this because the prophet sallallahu said either salahat the Prophet said that if it is rectified or if it is good or if it is sound or if it's healthy, then the whole body is healthy. And if it is sick or disease, then the whole body is disease. Verily, it is the heart. So it lets us know the position and the importance of the heart, you know, our iman, our intention, all of these things, they are going to make a, an effect on our actions in our body. Our body follows that, and our actions and our deeds. Those are some of the main uh, benefits of this hadith of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and we ask. Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jalla. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaytan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Nabi and Muhammad wa ala Ali wa sahbihi wa sallam.